Welcome to SnoozeCast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and also on our new YouTube channel at SnoozeCast. This episode is brought to you by The Silver Vial. Tonight, we'll read the final part to our Magic Cloak series from the book Queen Zixie of Ix or The Story of the Magic Cloak a children's book written by L. Frank Baum and published in 1905. In the last episode, Queen Zixie, King Bud, Princess Fluff, and Aunt Rivette search the countryside for the missing cloak. They have to piece and sew the cloak together, for it was cut up by a group of enthusiastic quilters and are still missing one little piece. The group decides to regroup at Zixie's palace and figure out what to do next. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. few deep breaths. Chapter 22 Ruffles Carries the Silver Vial When the group hunting for the cloak were back at the Witch Queen's palace in the city of Ix, the queen insisted that Bud and Fluff with their Aunt Rivette, should remain her guests until the cloak could be restored to its former complete state. And, for fear something else might happen to the precious garment, a silver chest was placed in Princess Fluff's room, and the magic cloak safely locked therein, the key being carried upon the chain around the girl's neck but their plans to wait patiently were soon interfered with by the arrival at Zixie's court of the talking dog, Ruffles, which had with much difficulty escaped from the Roly Rogues. Ruffles brought to them so harrowing a tale of the sufferings of the five high counselors and all the people of Noland at the hands of the fierce Roly Rogues, that Princess Fluff wept for her friends, and Bud became so cross that even Zixi was provoked with him. Something really must be done, declared the queen. I'll brew a magical mess in the witch kettle tonight and see if I can find a way to destroy those detestable Roly Rogues. Indeed, she was concerned the creatures would some day find their way into Ix. So when all the rest of those in the palace were sound asleep, Zixi worked her magic spell, and from the imps she summoned, she obtained advice how to act in order to get rid of the Roly Rogues. Next morning, she questioned Ruffles carefully. What do the Roly Rogues eat? she asked. Everything, said the dog, for they have no judgment and consume buttons and hairpins as eagerly as they do food. But there is one thing they are really fond of, and that is soup. They oblige old Tollydob, the Lord High General, who works in the palace kitchen, to make them a kettle of soup every morning, and this they all eat as if they were half starving. Very good, exclaimed the witch queen with pleasure. I think I see a way of ridding all Noland of these creatures. Here is a silver vial filled with a magic liquid. I will tie it around your neck, and you must return to the city of Knoll and carry the vial to Tollydob, the Lord High General. Tell him 
that on Thursday morning, when he makes the kettle of soup, he must put the contents of the vial into the compound, but let no one taste it afterward except the Roly Rogues. And what then? asked Ruffles, curiously. Then I will myself take charge of the creatures, and I have reason to believe the good citizens of Noland will no longer find themselves servants. All right, said the dog. I will do as you bid me, for I long to free my master and have revenge on the Roly Rogues. So Queen Zixi tied the silver vial to the dog's neck by means of a broad ribbon, and he started at once to return to Knoll. And when he had gone, the queen summoned all her generals and bade them assemble the entire army and prepare to march into Noland again. Only this time, instead of being at enmity with the people of Noland, the army of Ix was to march to their relief, and instead of bearing swords and spears, each man bore a coil of strong rope. For, said Zixi, swords and spears are useless where the Roly Rogues are concerned, as nothing can pierce their tough, rubber-like bodies, and more nations have been conquered by cunning than by force of arms. Bud and Fluff, not knowing what the witch queen meant to do, were much disturbed by these preparations to march upon the Roly Rogues. The creatures had terrified them so greatly that they dreaded to meet them again, and Bud declared that the safest plan was to remain in Zixi's kingdom and await the coming of the miller's son with the necktie. But, remonstrated Zixi, in the meantime your people are suffering terribly. I know, said Bud, and it nearly drives me frantic to think of it, but they will be no better off if we try to fight the Roly Rogues and are ourselves made servants. Why not try the magic cloak as it is, suggested the princess, and see if it won't grant wishes as before. There's only a small piece missing, and it may not make any difference with the power the fairies gave to it. Hooray, shouted Bud. That's a good idea. It's a magic cloak just the same, even if there is a chunk cut out of it. Zixi agreed that it was worth a trial, so the cloak was taken from the silver casket and brought into the queen's reception room. Let us try it on one of your maids of honor first, said Fluff, and if it grants her wish, we will know the cloak has lost none of its magic powers. Then you and Bud may both make your wishes. Very well, returned the queen, and she summoned one of her maids. I am going to lend you my cloak, said the princess to the maid, and while you wear it, you must make a wish. She threw the cloak over the girl's shoulders, and after a moment's thought, the maid said, I wish for a bushel of candies. Fudge, said Bud, scornfully. No, all kinds of candies, answered the maid of honor. But, although they watched her intently, the wish failed absolutely, for no bushel of candies appeared in sight. Let us try it again, suggested Fluff, while the others wore disappointed expressions. It was a foolish wish, anyhow, and perhaps the fairies did not care to grant it. So, another maid was called and given the cloak to wear. And may I wish for anything I desire? 
she asked eagerly. Of course, answered the princess, but as you can have but one wish, you must choose something sensible. Oh, I will, declared the maid. I wish I had yellow hair and blue eyes. Why did you wish that? asked Fluff angrily, for the girl had pretty brown hair and eyes. Because the young man I am going to marry says he likes blondes better than brunettes, answered the maid, blushing. But her hair did not change its color, for all the wish, and the maid said, with evident disappointment, Your magic cloak seems to be a fraud. It does not grant foolish wishes, returned the princess, as she dismissed her. When the maid had gone, Zixi asked, Well, are you satisfied? Yes, acknowledged Fluff. The cloak will not grant wishes unless it is complete. We must wait for the sailor man's necktie. Then my army shall march tomorrow morning, said the queen, and she went away to give the order to her generals. Chapter 23 The Destruction of the Creatures It was Tuesday when the army of Ix started upon its second march into Noland. With it were the Witch Queen, King Bud, Princess Fluff, and Aunt Rivette. At evening they encamped on the bank of the river, and on Wednesday the army was ferried across and marched up the side of the mountain that separated them from the valley of Noland. By night they had reached the summit of the mountain, but they did not mount upon the ridge for fear they might be seen by the Roly Rogues. Zixi commanded them all to remain quietly behind the ridge, and they lighted no fires and spoke only in whispers. And, although so many thousands of men lay close to the valley of Noland, not a sound came from them to warn the creatures that an enemy was near. Thursday morning dawned bright and pleasant, and as soon as the sun was up, the Roly Rogues came crowding around the palace kitchen, demanding that old Tollydob hurry the preparation of their soup. This the general did, trembling in spite of his ten feet of stature, for if they were kept waiting, the creatures were liable to prod his flesh with their thorns. But Tollydob did not forget to empty the contents of the silver vial into the soup, as the dog Ruffles had told him to do, and soon it was being ladled out to the Roly Rogues by Jicky, the four high counselors, and a dozen other servant officers of King Bud. And the dog Ruffles ran through the city, crying to every Roly Rogue he met, Hurry and get your soup before it's gone. It's especially good this morning. So, every Roly Rogue in the valley hurried to the palace kitchen for soup, and there were so many that it was noon before the last were served, while these became so impatient that they treated their servants in a bad manner. Yet, even while the last were eating, those who had earlier partaken of the soup lay around the palace sound asleep and snoring loudly, for the contents of the silver vial had the effect of sending all of them to sleep within an hour, and rendering them wholly unconscious for a period of ten hours. All through the city the Roly Rogues lay asleep, and, as they always withdrew their heads and limbs into their bodies 
when they slumbered, they presented a spectacle of thousands of huge balls lying motionless. When the big kettle was finally empty and the Lord High General paused to wipe the perspiration from his brow, the last of the Roly Rogues were rolling over on their backs from the effects of the potion which the Witch Queen brewed and placed in the silver vial. Aunt Rivette had been flying over the city since early morning, and although the Roly Rogues had been too intent upon their breakfast to notice her, the old woman's sharp eyes had watched everything that took place below. Now, when all the creatures had succumbed to the witch potion, Aunt Rivette flew back to the mountain where the army of Ix was hidden and carried the news to the witch queen. Zixi at once ordered her generals to advance, and the entire army quickly mounted the summit of the ridge and ran down the side of the mountain to the gates of the city. The people, who saw that something unusual was taking place, greeted Bud and Fluff and the Witch Queen with shouts of gladness, and Aunt Rivette, when she flew down among them, was given three hearty cheers. But there was no time for joyous demonstrations while the streets and public squares were cluttered with the sleeping bodies of the Roly Rogues. The army of Ix lost no time in carrying out their queen's instructions, and as soon as they entered the city, they took the long ropes they carried and wound them fast about the round bodies of the creatures, securely fastening their heads and limbs into their forms so that they could not stick them out again. Their enemies being thus rendered helpless, the people renewed their shouts of joy and gratitude and eagerly assisted the soldiers of Ix in rolling all the Roly Rogues outside the gates and to a wide ledge of the mountain. The Lord High General and all the other counselors threw away their aprons and tools of servitude and dressed themselves in their official robes. The soldiers of Tollydob's army ran for their swords and pikes, and the women unlocked their doors and trooped into the streets of Knoll for the first time since the descent of the creatures. But the task of liberation was not yet accomplished. All the Roly Rogues had to be rolled up the side of the mountain to the topmost ridge, and so great was the bulk of their bodies that it took five or six men to roll each one to the mountain top, and even then they were obliged to stop frequently to rest. But as soon as they got a Roly Rogue to the ridge, they gave it a push and sent it bounding down the other side of the mountain until it fell into the big river flowing swiftly below. During the afternoon, all the Roly Rogues were thus dumped into the river, where they bobbed up and down in the water, spinning around and bumping against one another until the current carried them out of sight on their journey to the sea. It was rumored later that they had reached an uninhabited island where they could harm no one except themselves. I'm glad they floated, said Zixi, as she stood upon the mountain ridge and watched the last of the creatures float out of sight. For if they had sunk, they would have filled up the river. There were so many of them. It was evening when Noland at last became free from her tyrants, 
and the citizens illuminated the entire city that they might spend the night in feasting and rejoicing over their freedom. The soldiers of Ix were embraced and made much of, and at the feasts they were the honored guests, while the people of Nolan pledged them their sincere friendship forever. King Bud took possession of the royal palace again, and Jicky bustled about and prepared a grand banquet for the king's guests, although the old valet grumbled a great deal because his six solemn servants would not assist in waiting upon anyone but himself. The Roly Rogues had destroyed many things, but the servants of the palace managed to quickly clear away the rubbish and to decorate the banquet hall handsomely. Bud placed the beautiful witch queen upon his right hand and showed her great honor, for he was really very grateful for her assistance in rescuing his country from the invaders. The feasting and dancing lasted far into the night, but when at last the people sought their beds, they knew they might rest peacefully and free from care, for the Roly Rogues had gone forever. Chapter 24 The Sailor's Return Next day, the Witch Queen returned with her army to the city of Ix to await the coming of the sailor with the necktie and King Bud set about getting his kingdom into running order again. The Lord High Purse Bearer dug up his magic purse, and Bud ordered him to pay the shopkeepers full value for everything the Roly Rogues had destroyed. The merchants were thus enabled to make purchases of new stocks of goods, and although all travelers had for many days kept away from Noland, for fear of the creatures, caravans now flocked in vast numbers to the city of Knoll, with rich stores of merchandise to sell, so that soon the entire city looked like a huge bazaar. Bud also ordered a gold piece given to the head of every family and this did no damage to the ever-filled royal purse, while it meant riches to the poor people who had suffered so much. Princess Fluff had carried her silver chest back to the palace of her brother, and in it lay, carefully folded, the magic cloak. Being now fearful of losing it, she warned Jicky, to allow no one to enter the room in which lay the silver chest, except with her full consent, explaining to him the value of the cloak. And was it this cloak I wore when I wished for half a dozen servants? asked the old valet. Yes, answered Fluff. Aunt Rivette bade you return it to me and you were so careless of it that nearly all the high counselors used it before I found it again. Then, said Jicky, heedless of the reproof, will your highness please use the cloak to rid me of these stupid servants? They are continually at my heels, waiting to serve me, and I am so busy myself serving others that those six young men almost drive me distracted. It wouldn't be so bad if they would serve anyone else, but they claim they are my servants alone and refuse to wait upon even His Majesty the King. Sometime I will try to help you, answered Fluff, but I shall not use the cloak again until the miller's son returns from his voyage at sea. So, Jicky was forced to wait as impatiently as the others for the sailor, and his servants had now become such a burden upon him 
that he grumbled every time he looked around and saw them standing in a stiff line behind him. Aunt Rivette again took possession of her rooms at the top of the palace, and although Bud, grateful for her courage in saving him and his sister from the Roly Rogues, would gladly have given her handsomer apartments, the old woman preferred to be near the roof, where she could take flight into the air whenever it pleased her to go out. With her big wings and her power to fly as a bird, she was the envy of all the old gossips she had known in the days when she worked as a laundress, and now she would often alight upon the doorstep of some humble friend and tell of the wonderful adventures she had encountered. This never failed to surround her with an admiring circle of listeners, and Aunt Rivette derived far more pleasure from her tattle than from living in a palace with her nephew, the king. The kingdom of Noland soon took on a semblance of its former prosperity, and the Roly Rogues were only remembered with shudders of repugnance and spoken of in awed whispers. And so the days wore away until late in the autumn when, one morning, a mounted soldier from Queen Zixi dashed into Knoll and rode furiously up to the palace gate. The sailor is found, he shouted, throwing himself from his horse and bowing low before little King Bud, who had come out to meet him. Good, remarked Bud. The Queen of Ix is even now riding to your majesty's city with a large escort surrounding the sailor, continued the soldier. And has he the necktie? asked Bud eagerly. He is wearing it, your majesty, answered the man, but he refuses to give it to anyone but the Princess Fluff. That's all right, said the king, and, re-entering the palace, he ordered Chicky to make preparations to receive the witch queen and her retinue. When Zixi came to the city gates, she found General Tollydob in a gorgeous new uniform, waiting to escort her to the palace. The houses were joyful with flags and streamers. Bands were playing, and on each side of the street along which the Witch Queen rode were lines of soldiers to keep the way clear of the crowding populace. Behind the queen came the sailor, carefully guarded by Zixi's most trusted soldiers. He looked uneasy at so great a reception and rode his horse as awkwardly as a sailor might. So the cavalcade came to the palace, which was thronged with courtiers and ladies in waiting. Zixi and the sailor were ushered into the great throne room where King Bud, wearing his ermine robe and jeweled crown, sat gravely upon his throne with Princess Fluff beside him. Your Majesty, began the Witch Queen, bowing prettily, I have brought you the sailor at last. He has just returned from his voyage and my soldiers captured him at his mother's cottage by the mill. But he refuses to give the necktie to anyone except the Princess Fluff. I am the Princess Fluff, 
said Meg to the sailor, and your necktie is part of my magic cloak, so please give it back to me. The sailor shifted uneasily from one foot to the other. My mother told me, he finally said, that King Bud would give me fifty gold pieces for it, and the Queen of Ix would give me another fifty gold pieces, and that your highness would give me fifty neckties. That is all true, returned Fluff. So here are the fifty neckties. Tilly Dib, the Lord High Purse Bearer, counted out fifty gold pieces, and Zixie's treasurer counted out another fifty, and all were given to the sailor. Then the miller's son unfastened the necktie from about his collar and handed it to Fluff. During the murmur of satisfaction that followed, the girl unlocked her silver chest, which Jicky had brought, and drew out the magic cloak. Lifting the skirt of the garment, she attempted to fit the sailor's necktie into the place it should go. And then, while everyone looked on with breathless interest, the girl lifted a white face to the sailor and exclaimed, This is not the necktie your mother gave you. For a moment, there was silence, while the assembly glared angrily upon the sailor. Then the king, rising from his seat, demanded, Are you sure, Fluff? Are you sure of that? Of course I'm sure, said the girl. It's neither the shape nor the color of the missing patch. Bud turned to the now trembling sailor. Why have you tried to deceive us? He asked sternly. Oh, your majesty, returned the man wringing his hands miserably. I lost the necktie in a gale at sea, for I knew nothing of its value. And when I came home, my mother told me of all the gold you had offered for its return, and advised me to deceive you by wearing another necktie. She said you would never know the difference. Your mother is a foolish woman, as well as dishonest answered Bud, and you shall both be punished. Telly Deb, he continued, addressing the Lord High Executioner, take this man to prison and see that he is fed on bread and water until further orders. Not so, exclaimed a sweet voice near the king, and then all looked up to see the beautiful Luia, queen of the fairies, standing beside the throne. Chapter 25 The Fairy Queen Every eye was now fixed upon the exquisite form of the fairy queen, which shed a glorious radiance throughout the room and filled every heart with an awe and admiration not unmingled with fear. The magic cloak was woven by my band, said the fairy, speaking so distinctly that all could hear the words. And our object was to bring relief to suffering mortal, not to add to their worries. Some good the cloak has accomplished, I am sure, but also has it been used foolishly and to no serious purpose. Therefore, I, who gave the cloak, shall now take it away. The good that has been done shall remain, but the foolish wishes granted shall now be cancelled. With these words, 
she turned and lightly lifted the shimmering magic garment from the lap of the princess. One moment, please, cried Bud eagerly. Cannot I have my wish? I waited until I could wish wisely, you know, and then the cloak wouldn't work. With a smile, Luia threw the cloak over the boy's shoulders. Wish, said she. I wish, announced Bud gravely, that I may become the best king that Noland has ever had. Your wish is granted, returned the fairy sweetly, and it shall be the last wish fulfilled through the magic cloak. But now, Zixi rushed forward and threw herself upon her knees before the fairy. Oh, your majesty, she began eagerly. But Lulia instantly silenced her with an abrupt gesture. Plead not to me, Queen of Ix, said the dainty immortal, drawing back from Zixi's prostrate form. You know that we fairies do not approve of witchcraft. However long your arts may permit you to live, you must always beware a mirror. Zixi gave a sob and buried her pretty face in her hands. And it was Fluff whose tender heart prompted her to raise the witch queen and try to comfort her. For a moment, all present had looked at Zixi. When their eyes again sought the form of the fairy, Lulia had vanished, and with her disappeared forever from Noland, the magic cloak. Some important changes had been wrought through the visit of the fairy, Jicky's six servants were gone, to the old valet's great delight. The ten-foot general had shrunk into six feet in height, Lulia having generously refrained from reducing old Tollydob to his former short stature. Ruffles, to the grief of the Lord High Steward, could no longer talk but Tallydab comforted himself with the knowledge that his dog could at least understand every word addressed to him. The Lord High Executioner found he could no longer reach farther than other men, but the royal purse of old Tillydib remained ever filled, which assured the future prosperity of the kingdom of Noland. As for Zixi, she soon became reconciled to her fate and returned to Ix to govern her country with her former liberality and justice. The last wish granted by the magic cloak was doubtless the most beneficial and far-reaching of all. For King Bud ruled many years with exceeding wisdom and gentleness and was greatly beloved by each and every one of his admiring subjects. The cheerfulness and sweet disposition of Princess Fluff became renowned throughout the world and when she grew to womanhood Many brave and handsome princes from other countries came to Noel to sue for her hand and her heart. One of these she married and reigned as queen of a great nation in after years, winning quite as much love and respect from her people as his loyal subjects bestowed upon her famous brother, King Bud of Noland.
the end.